thank you, uh, Harry, for for inviting me to do this. This is uh, uh, just reminded me that we first started talking about doing some stuff together uh, like five years ago. Um, and uh, Locus has been through a lot of iterations since then, and I've been through a lot of iterations since then. So uh, I'm, I'm glad we're finally able to, to put this together. Um, I have, as usual, uh, just kind of a ton of information, uh, probably too many slides uh, to get through in 50 minutes, but I'm gonna gonna hit some of the high points. And uh, you know, I'm not sure who in this room. I know you know some of you that I know uh, personally have some experience with, with agile, Kanban, lean methodologies. But uh, since I don't really know um, you know where everybody is in their own journey, um, you know, I'm just gonna talk high level for a minute about agile. And I I won't uh, I, you know I won't read the slide to you, but. Um, Suffice it to say, for those of you who don't know, right, Capital A Agile is kind of a, a project, you know, it's at least started as a project management methodology, but really it's a, a broader workflow methodology that is very common. Um, and I would say probably the de facto standard now in the software and technology industries. I'm sure, Harry, you probably use uh, Agile methods, Scrum and, and otherwise for uh, b building out the Locus uh, backend stuff. Um, yeah. Yes, we do. Mo mo most, yeah. So mo most software teams are doing a version of that. And the thing that that you know has come to light in the twenty years since the agile revolution started is that it's not just a technology thing. It's really a knowledge work thing, right? And that's sort of the thing that I started to discover as I was looking at agile for lawyers. Um, you know, starting back, gosh, probably ten years ago was when I first like started having the ideas. Um, you know, I've worked with several people. Uh, some of you may know Jess Birkin. Uh, she's a friend and a client of mine. Um, and, you know, we started with just a very basic, in fact, we were at a conference together and we like went into a, a side room at the, uh, at the conference venue and like grabbed a pack of sticky notes and just built a basic Kanban board on the wall at the conference talking about her workflow. And like, she went back and put it in a place and like, literally she she jumped her her billable hours average um, seventy percent, and then I just uh, I'm on a Slack group with her, and uh, she has already hit her November um, uh, revenue targets. As she said, you know, here on the what is it, the twelfth of of November. So she's really jamming. Um, uh, another firm, this is Liz Wozniak up in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, which is a uh, a really great little town. Um, and she's using it in an immigration practice. So there's lots of different contexts. You know, I've, I've got clients now. I mean, I've been doing this uh, more or less full time for like six years now. And, you know, I've got clients who are litigators. I've got clients who are uh, estate planning, immigration, um, family law, kind of, it, it really does work in a lot of different places. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know me, I've... Um, I spent about 10 years in the tech industry before I went to law school, um, most of that with a company called Getty Images. Um, I had my own, you know, I was in-house for a while. I had my own sort of um, IP practice uh, doing mostly copyright and trademark law. Uh, I co-chaired the Futures Task Force uh, up here in Oregon, uh, and I'm currently on the Board of Governors for the Oregon Bar, and uh, I do a lot of work with other nonprofits and, and things like that. So again, like I said, I don't know exactly where everyone is in their own uh, personal understanding of, of lean or agile or the Kanban methodology. So uh, I, I'm kind of assuming that you're at ground zero. So if you've never heard of or never used Kanban before, I'm going to issue this challenge to try Kanban for a day. Um, and even though we're uh, you know on a webinar for a software tool, uh, Locus, which is a great one that can do Kanban, I want you to start just by using your wall because I think there's something really effective um, in learning in sort of the physical um, visual world. So all you really need is a small chunk of, of white space uh, on you know, and it can be a blank wall, it can be a whiteboard. Um, a pack of sticky notes and you know a sharpie or a dry erase marker. Uh, I usually say avoid using a fine tipped pen. Uh, I'm I'm a big believer. Right, the what, one of the sort of tricks of the methodology is that there's a, an advantage to keeping things high level at this visual um, planning phase, and so. Uh, uh, I sometimes say big pens yield big ideas, so uh, it's okay. You want to run out of space. That's actually a feature, um, not not a limitation of the uh, of the methodology. 
if you stick with doing this in the physical world, right, you might want some painter's tape to make lines on your wall, uh, scotch tape only because stickies aren't always as sticky as you would like them to be. Um, it avoids what uh, I sometimes refer to as the autumn of Kanban, where uh, you, you come into your office the next morning and all these uh, wonderful notes uh, are uh, in a pile of leaves on your floor. Um, and then, you know, some scissors or a, a yardstick if it helps uh, tidy things up um, if you're into that sort of thing. And the basic Kanban board, it's really simple. And again, you've probably seen this, right? It's two lines, three columns, uh, to do, doing, and done. And that's it, right? Those are the phases of work. And, uh, you know, you can do it, uh, like I said, on a wall with a whiteboard. You can do it um, just on a wall without the blue painter's tape, right? Just use sticky notes. Your brain knows what columns look like. If you want to cut them down, that works fine too. Uh, I'm going to use this structure just because it kind of works out for... Um, the way I'm trying to put it through on the slides. So you start because this is the thing we're doing right now, right? You're building a Kanban board. So this is the thing, if you wanna follow along or watch the replay, uh, you make that note and you stick it in the doing column um, because that's where it belongs. Uh, and then you basically, if you're doing it for a day, you just kind of take your sticky note and for uh, each thing that you're trying to accomplish with the rest of the day today, you write it down on a sticky. And then we're going to put it in this to-do column, uh, roughly in the order of importance, not roughly, in the order of importance that you're trying to, to, to get it through, right? And you want to keep it realistic. So one of the keys to Kanban is being really clear and really intentional about how much work you let into your system. Because if you overload it, it gets really unlikely that you're going to finish all of these things in one day. So it's better off just keeping it simple um, and going through it that way. Uh, another thing that I think is important is to make sure that as you write these tasks on a card, uh, try to make them as actionable as possible. And that usually requires verbs. So build, draft, that's great. Marketing, eh, that's a little vague. So, you know, come up with something more specific, more actionable. If you're into GTD, right, it's that next, next actionable step. Um, and use that instead of the more uh, the high level things. And that's it, right? We've built a basic Kanban board, so we can move that over to done. Um, and you know, I say do a little happy dance every time you move something to done. There is something about this methodology um, that kind of works for our brain's feedback loops. Uh, when you move work into the done column, you get a little dopamine squirt. It feels good, right? Uh, the other thing that's true is you've now freed up capacity in your doing column um, to do the next piece of work. So you're going to drag the highest priority item from to do into doing, then you're going to work on just that thing, right? And monotasking is a big part of what makes this methodology work. It's really important that you try as much as possible to focus on not throwing too many balls in the air. And I'll talk a little bit about more or a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then as you finish it, obviously you're going to move stuff to done. You're going to do your little happy dance. Uh, it's going to come just sort of automatically. Um, and keep moving work through your system. And if you've done a good job estimating um, the work that you have, you're going to wind up at the end of the day with a board that looks like this, and you will have done lots of little happy dances, um, and you'll feel pretty good. But even if you've come up short, that's okay, because one of the things that this Kanban methodology is really good for is helping you come to a more honest reckoning with your actual capacity. And, and I'll talk more about that in a minute as well. Um, but you want to get better at estimating how much space you have to do the work. You also want to get better at estimating how big the work is, right? So um, obviously not all of these things are going to be equal length and you can start to use um, estimations and other tools for trying to figure out how big a chunk of work you've got um, for each individual card. So a few things that you learn from just that basic Kanban exercise, uh, and I think it's helpful, right? Number one is it introduces this idea of sort of a third state of work or the state of work that often is hidden from some you know, typical like productivity methodologies. And I'm sure all of you have used a to-do list before, right? It's, it's kind of the default for most people. Um, but the problem with a to-do list is that it only has two states, right? The work is either done or it's not done. Um, and it doesn't really capture work that you've got, your balls that you have in flight, work that is in progress, but not finished yet. 
And so the thing about the Kanban board is that it captures this third state, this in-progress state that allows you to say clearly, okay, this is something that I need to do, but I haven't started yet. Uh, here's something that I have started and I am working on, right? This is an actual active task. And then these are the things that I'm done and I can go ahead and you know close down my brain about those things because I don't have to worry about them anymore. And the reason that works actually comes from this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard of it. Uh, Daniel Kahneman is a, a Nobel laureate, um, right? And it basically comes down to, and there's many great concepts in this book, but one of the ones that... Um, is sort of what was one that caught the um, the public eye a lot was this idea between system one or this this difference between system one thinking and system two thinking. So as you can read, system one thinking is like our autonomous thinking. It's our knee jerk reactions. It's our ability to really quickly absorb information. Um, just based on what we're perceiving in the world. Uh, it is very often visual, right? We, we perceive, we take in just so much information through our eyes. Um, although it can also be auditory, it can be smell, um, right? It's often, what it's, what it's usually not is um, system two stuff, right? Which is more analytical. It's more contextual, right? System one thinking is what allows us to read uh, big words on a billboard quickly. Uh, system two thinking is what allows us to analyze case law, right? It's, it's slower. It takes a lot of effort. Um, it produces amazing work, but it just isn't as intuitive. It's not as fast. It takes a, a bigger sort of tax on your brain. And at the end of the day, right, the Kanban board is much closer to system one and the to-do list is closer to system two, right? It gives you this, the Kanban board gives you this visual sense of what's going on um, either in your day or in your week or in your practice. Whereas the, the to-do list, you kind of have to process those words differently and your brain will try to make sense of, oh, okay, I have to call, uh, you know, this guy Meltzer. Um, like what, what do I have to do? What's this part of thing again? And like your brain spends a lot of time just trying to load information about tasks, um, when it's in this sort of textual, um, format. So there's that. I'm actually going to skip, um, this little piece. Cause I, uh, I think, uh, I'm going to hit these concepts. Um, a little bit later. And what I actually want to do, well, I'll skip to this part, right? So this idea, um, and, and what I had been talking about, let's see here, come on, um, right? The, uh, the, the high level, um, what I just skipped over was a discussion of project management 101 and process improvement 101. Um, they're slightly different things, but at the end of the day, a matter really has elements of both, right? So a project is usually when you're trying to build something that's completely new. Um, it requires um, some analytics and some, some unraveling to figure out like what are the requirements, what are the features we're actually trying to big, uh, we're trying to build. Um, a process tends to be more repeatable, right? It's like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna put these things into the the workload or the workflow. And the process will go through and it should come out the other side in a very regular way. And the way I talk about it with a lot of my clients is, is you have to figure out how much of your practice is sheet music and how much of it is jazz, right? And for those parts that are sheet music, you really want to, as much as possible, um, document it, right? Get it all down on paper or in whatever you know the program happens to be. <coughs> So that you can then, you know, build the equivalent of a player piano role if you're old school, uh, a, a MIDI file or a whole like garage band thing um, if you're modern and be able to play with it, right? Adjust the tempo, uh, turn up the rhythm, uh, try different combinations that work better. Um, but really it's about the automation or the um, standardization of that work. And that frees you up to do this other part, which I've, uh, you know, referring to here as jazz, the freestyling, right? The, the deeper thinking that we have to do for more complicated matters, uh, more eccentric matters. Um, and, you know, it gives us the space to really go in and do that work. Um, both tool sets help you meet duties to clients. And I'm going to move through this kind of quickly. I have a different presentation that I give um, that focuses on the ethics of legal project management and um, the, you know, the, the basic uh, concept behind that presentation is the sort of best practices of project management um, 
line up really well with what I call the front five rules of ethics, right? These duties that you have of competence and diligence and communication uh, and things like that. But I'm going to flow through that or go th through that quickly. And I'm going to talk uh, for the next couple minutes about bottleneck theory. And I think this is one of the key reasons to um, adopt a more agile or lean workflow. I also think it's one of the core concepts that is critical to you being able to um, make the kind of progress you want in improving your own practices within your law firm. So, uh, and again, some of you maybe have heard me go through this before, but uh, consider this a, a refresher. Um, high level, what bottleneck theory tells us is that in any multi-step process, there is always a single bottleneck that constrains the flow of work through the entire system. Uh, and we'll digest that for a minute. Uh, the place you see it in real life, um, more you know, as often as any, is uh, traffic. Right? We'll see things that um, you know when that lane next down, uh, we know that cars back up um, behind where that bottleneck is, and then the flow resumes once um, once that bottleneck is alleviated. If you're delivering um, some valuable widget, right, in this case represented by the star, um, right, there's there are multi steps in almost every process, and one of them is neck down, right? It's it's always, always going to be one, and I've exaggerated it here, um, you know, for for illustration purposes, um, but there's always going to be one part of your overall process where work tends to get stuck. And, you know, the way I say it, and, and a lot of people say, well, I have lots of bottlenecks in my practice. And that's true. You probably do have lots of bottlenecks, but only one of them is the worst, right? It's, it's the same as saying every chain has a weakest link, right? So that worst part of your bottleneck is where the work is, is really the true limiting factor for your entire uh, workflow or practice. And once you accept that basic premise, then there are two corollaries that also uh, have to follow from the, the basic theory of constraints. The first one is great, and it's pretty straightforward for most people, which is if you can improve the flow of work at your bottleneck, then you will improve the flow of your whole system, right? Um, it, it goes pretty simple, right? So watch this very dramatic animation here, um, right? As you're uh, if you take uh, steps to improve part two of this overall process, then you'll widen things out and then all of those little star parts will flow through the whole system a little bit more efficiently, a little bit more effectively. And again, that one is pretty easy for most people to wrap their heads around. This other corollary um, is a little, it's, it's easy to understand intellectually, it's hard for people to put into practice. And, and I'm guilty too, right? It's just human nature, but it's that any improvement you try to make to a part of your system that isn't the bottleneck can't help. So things that you're doing in process improvement for your overall practice, if you're not working at the bottleneck, you're probably wasting your time. And I'll illustrate it, or, you know, we can kind of see it here in this overall graphic, right? If we were to open up the flow of work at this first step, then all that's going to happen is more pressure is going to be put on that second step, right? It's like you got a kink in the hose, but you open up the faucet a little bit more, right? You don't get any more water flowing out the other end. All you do is build up pressure in that front part of the hose. Uh, the other part, and this one's easy to, to understand, right? If if you can't, if you don't get that kink out, right? If you don't solve for that bottleneck, then it doesn't matter what you do to like make the rest of the pipeline flow more smoothly because it's just going to get starved for things to work on, right? It can't, it can't possibly help. And if you replace sort of that high level, you know, generic workflow with a legal process workflow, um, right? You can see how this might work. And I'm not saying that that this uh, represents any one person's workflow. This is very generic. But for this particular uh, graphic, you can see that the actual bottleneck for this practice is in the drafting stage, um, right? So there's a couple of, of ramifications of the second corollary that, again, are uh, important, but sometimes hard to wrap your heads around. Um, one of them is that your pet peeve is probably not your bottleneck. Um, it might be, I'm not saying it's definitely not your bottleneck, but I see this a lot with the practices I work with is that there are certain activities that drive different people crazy. And it's not always the same thing, right? Sometimes a paralegal gets, gets driven crazy by one thing, an associate, another, and a partner or something else. Um, and the natural tendency when you're doing process improvement is to go work on the thing that's bugging you. 
Um, and again, it can feel good, but if the, the thing you have to be careful of is if that thing that's bugging you is upstream of your actual bottleneck, then you're just going to put more pressure on the bottleneck itself, right? And that can actually cause more harm than good, right? That additional pressure creates turbulence. It creates uh, stress on your overall systems. Um, it, it isn't really good for your practice. Uh, the other, and you've read it by now on the slide, but intake is probably not your bottleneck. And this is a thing, and, and a lot, a lot, a lot of software tools um, and legal marketers and all the rest um, will spend a lot of time focusing on how do you get more work into your system. And I would argue that that's not usually the best place to spend time, especially if you have a more mature practice. If you're just starting out um, and you're trying to get more clients in the door, then sure, yeah, it actually might be intake. But if you're a more established practice, um, my experience at least is that most lawyers, most law firms um, have an oversupply of demand, right? And granted, again, there, there are tricks to finding the right clients, um, ideal clients and all the rest. But um, I still argue that for the most part, that is the bottleneck of, of most practices. And I really think of most practices as having three high level pipelines, right? And they, they obviously work together. So the getting the work pipeline, the doing the work pipeline and the getting paid pipeline, uh, you know, roughly speaking, this is marketing uh, sort of delivery and then billing and AR. Um, you know, if your bottleneck is in the getting paid pipeline, um, there's a lot of really pretty straightforward ways to try to solve for that. If you're not using evergreen retainers, you probably should be. If you're not accepting credit cards, you probably should be. Um, my guess is that most of the people that are looking at Locus and looking at these tools don't have this problem. But um, if you do, call me or, or talk to me. We can talk about ways to, to solve it. It's kind of the easiest set um, to solve for. Um, the other two, right, it, again, it kind of depends for, in the most part, where your practice is. Um, and like I said, my experience is that most mature law practices usually don't have a marketing problem. They usually have a delivery problem. They've got so much in the pipeline that's gumming up the works that it's not flowing through smoothly enough. And because of that, um, a lot of times I see people that are sabotaging the marketing work that they're already doing, right? They'll be slow to return calls. Um, you know, they won't follow with, with clients very well. They don't stick to their content marketing schedules, things like that. And that's fine, right? Because if, if that's not your bottleneck, then you should be making improvements in your delivery pipeline where your, where your actual bottleneck is. Um, so like I said, right, if, if the bottleneck is in your delivery pipeline, then improving your marketing is a bit of a waste. So the last thing, just sort of high level concept wise, um, that I want to touch on is this idea of matching your finite capacity to priority. And so this is a part of a, a, a redo of um, one of the slides I skipped over earlier. But one of the things that that happens, right? And there's this um, a great Freakonomics podcast episode that I, I encourage you to look up called "Why Your Project Are Always Late." Um, and it talks about, so this is the iron triangle of project management. Sorry, I skipped over it before. So basically what it says is that it, for any project, right, these are, uh, this is sort of the triple constraint. And um, the job of a project manager is to ensure the delivery of a high quality product, right? That's the seal in the middle by matching um, resources that are available to deliver a certain scope within a certain time frame. Right, and the idea is is that um, if the uh, scope of a project goes up, then at least one of the other two parts of this triangle also have to change. Right, so if the scope uh, increases, then you either have to throw more resources at that project uh, in order to deliver on time, or the deadline is going to shift. Right, or both. Right. Um, so this is, again, very high level on, on the project management triangle. But I bring it up, right, because there are two sort of human cognitive biases, uh, going back to this Kahneman book, that um, kind of self-reinforce to cause us to perceive things um, poorly when it comes to these elements of the project management triangle. The optimism bias um, is basically where we think we're going to be better at doing something than we actually are. Um, we think our resources are more plentiful or more capable, um, and that usually is especially true of ourselves. 
Um, it, it, ironically, one of the ways to counter the optimism bias is to get someone else to estimate um, how good you are at something because we tend to be much more clear-eyed uh, in our assessment of other people um, than we are in ourselves. Uh, the other piece is the planning fallacy, and that causes us to underestimate how how long something is going to take, right? Sometimes that's how big it is. Sometimes that's how complex it is. Um, we also have a huge tendency to underestimate the um, potential for bad outcomes or for surprises to come in in a project, right? We always, when we're making plans, we tend to plan for the ideal state and we're less good at planning for um, the bad things that can happen. Again, very high level, but that's that's what these biases are. And the way they work, right, because you don't think anything's going to go wrong, you think that your resources are going to be more available or more plentiful um, than they're likely to be, right? That's the optimism bias. Um, you also think you have all kinds of time because this stuff isn't going to take very long. It's pretty simple, whatever, right? That's the planning fallacy. And when you have both of those things going at the same time, the natural tendency is to say, oh, well, we can get all kinds of stuff done. We let the scope grow. But then eventually reality sets in, right? And it's like, oh, gosh, uh, you know, I thought I had resources, but so-and-so has a doctor's appointment and uh, somebody else um, has a kid homesick, whatever it happens to be. So, you know, we don't have the resources we thought we had. Um, also, it's more complicated than I thought it was going to be. It's going to take longer. So I don't have the time that I thought I had. But now I'm stuck. I've committed to this higher scope. And that basically means you kind of only have two options at this point. One is you can try to shrink the scope, and that's great if you can get away with it. The other is that if you try to do the same thing um, with less time and less resources, then quality suffers. And that's the outcome we don't want to see. So one of the benefits of the Kanban methodology is that it kind of forces you into what I refer to as an honest reckoning with your capacity, right? And this idea, your resources are finite, your time is finite, and you might get away with pretending otherwise for a little while, right? You can, you can make some diving catches, you can pull some all-nighters, but that's not going to be sustainable, right? It's, it's no way to run a law practice, it's no way to live a life. It frankly is the source of a lot of burnout uh, in our profession. And, and, you know, I, I think you probably all know that that burnout is a very real problem. Once you're honest about your capacity, that then also gets you into this second piece, which is it sort of forces you to make a more realistic assessment of your priorities, right? If your capacity is limited, then you have to take a step back and figure out, okay, which of the things that is on my plate, right? The practically infinite number of things that I could be spending time on, what is the best use of my time right now? What's going to deliver the best value um, for my client, for my firm, for my constituents, et cetera, right? So that's the, the act of prioritization. Okay, I'm going to take a quick sip of water, um, and then I'm going to get into productivity Kanban. I should say, if you do have questions along the way, feel free to um, throw them into the chat. Oop, maybe people are throwing them into the chat, and I just missed it. Oh, no, here there. Some... Uh, uh, some good things. Yeah, Carol, Carol's got the chat going. So thank you, Carol. Um, great. So productivity Kanban. And I'll tell you, um, right, the, the basic Kanban methodology you've seen, right, is this, uh, whoops, I gotta click back in here, is this to-do, doing, and done, this three-column board, right? Productivity Kanban is just kind of like what I said, right? It's about mostly personal productivity. It works really well for individuals. It can scale to teams of maybe one or two people, um, but it doesn't really hold that beyond that. Um, and what it is, well, and some people call it personal Kanban. There's actually a pretty good book. Um, it's a few years old now called Personal Kanban um, that, that is a version of this particular uh, methodology. I do it a little bit differently than, um, and I'm spacing on the author's name, but um, I do it a little bit differently than he does, but um, still conceptually, it's, it's really good stuff. So effectively what productivity Kanban is about is expanding out the to-do column so that you can sort of funnel work into your doing state, um, right? And it looks roughly like this. So you kind of want to get work, this whole universe of work that's in your backlog, or the, the, the possible things you can do, and neck it down so that at any given moment, you're actually doing the most valuable thing that you could be doing. And it won't be perfect, right? But you want, you want to get there directionally. 
And it winds up looking something like this, right? So you have this backlog of, of this big universe of things you can do. And then you kind of slowly work it down through the days so that at this moment, hopefully the highest and best use of your time is attending this webinar, um, right? And it's a thing that you're doing right now. Um, some of you may or may not be multitasking, uh, but um, ideally you're not, right? Uh, uh, you're, you're probably not getting the best bang from your buck out of either activity uh, if you are. And it obviously won't look like this funnel. It's going to look a little bit, a little bit more like this. Um, and, you know, there's lots of different ways to build out those columns to the left of doing. This is just one possibility. Um, you know, some people have queues. Uh, one thing that's really common that I do with teams is we'll actually have multiple backlogs. Um, so we might have a backlog for marketing and biz dev. We might have another backlog for client work. We might have another backlog for uh, finance, for operations, right? So there doesn't always have to be just one backlog. Uh, in fact, it sometimes can be really effective to sort of categorize the, the universe of things that you've got, um, of demands that you have on your time in, in different ways. Um, but obviously, I'll run out of room on the slide, so I can't show you all the various uh, permutations now. Uh, the other thing, and I won't go too deep into it, but I do have sort of a special rule. You'll notice this waiting column, which is to the right of doing. And the thing I'll point out about waiting is that you should limit it to times when you're waiting on an external resource, right? If you just throw things into the waiting column um, because you got it kind of half done, but you want to start working on something else, that's not what the waiting column's for. Right, the waiting column is like, okay, I got this as far as I can get it. Now I need to like throw it over to somebody else to get me some piece of information to do a piece of review or whatever. Um, right, so I like to make sure that that waiting column is is specific to um, to third parties, to outside resources. Um, I'm going to introduce, right, these are the five rules of Kanban. I put rules in, in quotes because they're not really rules. It's just kind of the things that, that you do that make this process and this methodology work. Uh, and the first one we've been working on already, which is to make the work and the workflow visible. Um, and just this piece, right, it goes a remarkably long way to um, improving the way that people think about and see their practice. So um, I won't go too deep into that. Uh, too much deeper into that right now, other than um, the one thing to keep uh, in mind is to beware of uh, hidden work, right? Work that you do in your day that doesn't actually make it onto a card and make it onto a board. Um, you know, one of the things, if, I, if I'm going deeper into this make the work visible part, I'll sometimes uh, have, have a second piece of it, which says all the work, right? And one of the things that can derail um, this productivity tool is if you're not honest with your board about the work that you're doing. So you got to tell it everything. The second part of the rules of Kanban is limiting work in progress. And so I do want to talk about that a little bit because it's, it's an incredibly powerful piece of the methodology. Uh, and one of these unofficial slogans of the Kanban methodology is start less to finish more. And the idea here is that you really want to make sure that you're focusing on one thing and working it as much as you can until it is actually done, right? So in this case, uh, ideally, you're not going to start drafting this Bridges letter until uh, Harry and I finally uh, hit the end meeting uh, link on the Zoom button and, uh, and shut this thing down. Um, if it is the thing that you need to do that's more important, that's great. You know, maybe throw uh, uh, attend webinar into the waiting column or make a new sticky for finished webinar and you can go back and watch the recording. Uh, hopefully nobody drops off right now. Um, so, but you want to build some structure in, right? So you'll see I've got this whip limit of one in the doing column. I also created this whip limit of five in the today column, right? That's again, that's recognizing the, the, the finite nature of your capacity. Um, and the way that I've done it here, right, I'm kind of assuming five cards, but really that might be five hours. Uh, so you might say, okay, the Bridges letter is going to take me uh, an hour and a half. The Melton trademark is going to take me two hours. Um, and so you're building up to maybe an eight-hour day instead of a five-card day. There's, there's lots of different ways to play with it. But coming up with some concept of, of limiting the amount of work that you're going to throw in process and even limiting the, the cues that are putting pressure on your doing column um, can be really important. 
And if that goes well, right, um, you're sort of protecting yourself from these cognitive biases, then over time, you're going to move more and more things into the done column, and you're going to get that little dopamine squirt every time, and you're going to love it, right? There's, there's something really fun about seeing that done column fill up with work. Um, let's see here. Oh, I've got extra slides in there. Um, so that's, I think, all I'm going to talk about with the with the um, productivity Kanban. And I've got uh, about 10 minutes left to hit on the other side, which is workflow Kanban. So let me get that going. Obviously, I have some phantom animations in there or something. So workflow Kanban. Um, Conceptually similar to productivity, except this time, instead of expanding out the to-do column, we're going to expand out this middle column, the, what, what I had been calling the doing column. But because actually all of the things in the doing column are now in progress work, we should change that label too. And I'm going to throw up just a very high level, uh, again, similar to that bottleneck uh, drawing that I had. Um, you know, This is kind of a generic transactional workflow, maybe estate planning, maybe immigration, uh, maybe business formation. It doesn't really matter, right? Uh, I've kept it very generic here, but uh, you know, know that you can customize your own board to match the workflow phases that, that make sense to you. I kind of had a, a, an estate planning workflow in mind when I built this out. So I'm going to throw some people names in here um, and we're going to pretend that these are all people that have estate plans uh, at, at various stages along the way. And, you know, if your Kanban board looks like this, you're probably in really good shape, right? This is nice, even flow. Stuff is flowing through the work. It's balanced. Um, my guess is that that's probably not reality. So um, the thing that is more likely is that you're going to have cards that are, or, you know, sections of your board that are filling up with work. And, oh, what do you know? A lot of these uh, places where cards are stacked up have to do with client homework. And that is one of the big truisms, right, uh, out of bottleneck theory with the firms that I work with. Um, the bottlenecks uh, for most law practices, especially those in people law, um, are almost always in client homework phases, right? And, and it's an interesting thing, right? Go, going back to project management for a second, um, I actually think it's important that you think about your customer, your client, is not just the end customer for the work, but also as a resource in your project, right? They have necessary information, um, skills, knowledge, et cetera, to, um, that they have to execute. They have to do their part of the work in order for you and the rest of your team to be able to do your parts of the work. And so it's not uncommon for there to be client homework that turns out being a bottleneck. And partly that's because most lawyers don't do a very good job of project managing their client and treating their client as a resource in the project as well as the end customer of the final uh, of the final deliverables. And I'll just layer this on here, right? I mean, you can see where the bottlenecks are. If work is stacking up, that's a really good indicator that that part of your process is a bottleneck. Uh, and in this case, because work is stacking up the most at this gathering information stage, I think that's probably the, the place that it's most likely, the bottleneck's most likely to be for this, um, for this practice, right? So how do you deal with... Um, clearing out these bottlenecks. And that gets to this next of the five rules of Kanban, which is to make policies explicit. Um, and by that, I don't mean, you know, uh, R-rated, right? I mean, getting them out on paper, making sure that they're expressed well. And this actually gets back to the better use of a checklist. And a lot of you probably are familiar with this book, The Checklist Manifesto. Uh, it's very popular. If you don't know it, it's a must read. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent book. Um, it's got some really great things. But one of the things that people actually miss uh, about this book is the subject title. And I'm not sure how well you can read it on your screens. So I'll uh, put it out here, right? The subtitle of this book is not how to get things done. And in fact, if you ask most people that that's probably what they would say, it's about how to get things right. And the key, the distinction is that this is a book about quality control. And this is a book about defining what a quality standard looks like, so that the team can execute work to that standard. Um, I skipped over this slide before, but it's one of the key process improvement concepts that comes out of Toyota manufacturing and the Toyota way. So how do we do that in 
um, practice, right? Oh, sorry, one, one other piece, actually, in terms of um, the benefits that you get from quality, from defining quality. And I will say that, like, one of the problems, another one of the problems that I run into all the time with legal work is that lawyer's version of quality control is, I know what it looks like when I see it. And the problem with the I know it when I see it version of quality control is that you have to see it in order for it to be uh, for you to be satisfied that it's going to be a high quality outcome. And so part of what um, I spend a lot of the time doing is kind of like, uh, you know, that Harry Potter thing where you use the wand to pull thoughts and memories out of somebody's head and put it in the bowl so that other people can see it, right? I want to get those definitions of quality out of the lawyer's head, out of the paralegal's head, out of whoever, right? Whoever the specific uh, particular expert is for that part of the process. And I want to define it. I want to make it explicit. I want to make it express. And what winds up happening is this really cool chain reaction, right? Which is once you come up with a definition of quality, then the team, uh, including yourself, will begin to standardize your deliverables to that quality definition, right? So that is the literal definition of a quality standard. When that happens, then the output of the team begins to get more consistent because one of the problems with the I know it when I see it version of quality control is that our memories aren't perfect and we often don't get it exactly right every time. So once you're going to spec to standard, then the work, the deliverable becomes more consistent. The other thing that happens is that if you can communicate that standard to multiple members of your team and they have the knowledge and the skills and the experience to execute that standard, it creates uh, load balancing within your particular work group. And this is true whether your team are your employees, whether you're using a third party like Law Clerk Legal um, or some other outsourcer, right? Getting that quality standard is part of the key to being able to delegate more, to be able to balance your loads more. And that in turn improves the capacity of your team, right? So if you've got more people who are able to execute the same tasks, that means that you, know, you can put person A on it when person B is busy and vice versa, which means that that overall there's going to be less downtime because there will always be things for, for folks to work on. That's going to cause the work to flow, flow more smoothly through your overall processes. And that is the definition of efficiency, right? You're doing more, you're delivering more valuable work using the same resources that you had before, right? You're just doing it better. And that's what makes you more efficient. So again, how do we make a policy in the form of a quality standard that's going to help with this workflow on your Kanban board? And the answer um, is this better use of a checklist, which I call the definition of done. And there will be a separate definition of done for each phase on your Kanban board. And it just kind of goes basically like this, right? Whatever it happens to be, uh, this is the engagement one, uh, intake one, right? These are the things that absolutely positively have to be true or at least accounted for in order for a matter to get out of engagement and actually begin doing the legal work on it, right? And you will do this, right? And take it, whoops, uh, You'll take it and put it on your board, right? Again, this is assuming a physical board and there's ways and, and Harry, I'm sure can tell you how to do this uh, even with automations um, in Locus, um, right? But in a physical board, you would take this and put it right up on the board, right? And then you would come up with definitions of done for each one of these workflow phases. And I actually like to draw it, or when I'm doing it in a physical world, I'll move them over and put them right on these lines, right? Because really what these are, these are kind of the sentries, right? These are the, the flow control. Um, uh, they're the things that are causing you to really have to focus on what does quality look like before I move something into the next phase. So let's focus on Erica Raymond at the end just uh, for a second. And one of the things, and I think I might've mentioned this before, but as you're reading a Kanban board, right, there's two ways to assess priority. One of them I know I talked about, which is your higher priority items for a particular column should be at the top of that column. The other thing, and one that, that people maybe miss a lot, and I think this is important, especially for you current Locus users, um, is that you should also prioritize that work in your system that is closer to done. Uh, and the reason why is that it represents the most amount of WIP, right? You've made the most investment in that thing, in that, that particular project, um, without delivering the final benefit to the client, right? So the client, whether or not the client's paid you along the way or not, 
right? The client isn't paying you to work on their matter. They're paying you to finish the matter. And so by focusing on those things that are closest to done, it actually does three things that are, that are really important, right? Number one, it de delivers value to the client. Uh, number two, if you are a flat fee biller, even if you're an hourly biller, it allows you to, to collect an exchange of value, right? You, you get to earn revenue, uh, ideally, when you make that final step. The third thing it does is it actually opens up capacity on your board, right? You create some space that you can now pull more work into. And I, I won't go uh, deep into this idea of pull systems versus push systems, but that moving, working the board from right to left is one of the essential uh, sort of tools for moving yourself into a pull-based system, right, rather than a push-based system. And a pull-based system, one of the reasons why it's important is that it does honor your actual capacity, right? If you have a push-based system, you're just trying to shove more, you know, meat into the sausage tube, eventually something's going to burst. And I apologize if that's a graphic uh, metaphor. But if you're pulling work based on your actual finishing and your actual deliverable, then you're not going to put those uh, higher pressures on um, on the, the, the system. So again, real quick, Erica Raymond is going to go up and we're not going to move from execute into done until we've uh, compared it to this definition of done checklist. Um, I'm going to show you, and I know I'm running low on time, so I'm going to do go through this kind of quickly. You see, I've re, uh, reworked the checklist so that it's numbered instead of checkboxes. Uh, both ways work, but in a physical world, I actually learned this from a client. You can use a label maker to sort of create these numbers. And then what's cool is that as you finish items on the definition of done checklist, you just slash them on the card. And when all seven things are slashed, you know that, okay, this is uh, this one's ready to go. I can go ahead and put it in the done column. And that's great because now you've you've met this quality standard and you know that it's actually done. And that's true for every column on your board upstream of here as well. <laughs> I'm going to hit briefly on the other two rules of Kanban, and I'm going to leave uh, a minute or two for Harry to wrap up at the end. Um, and and uh, I haven't seen any questions come in through the chat, so I'm assuming there are none, or you can uh, come, come bug me, find me separately. Um, number one is we want to optimize for the work to flow forward and not backwards, right? So that left to right flow. One of the reasons or one of the ways to do that, right? Let's assume that you have finished the work for Erica Raymond, but like a month later, she calls you up and she's like, I don't have got my estate plan finished, but I, what do I do now? I've got this like weird trust thing and I'm not sure what to do about it. And you have to spend a bunch of time on the phone with her, figure, you know, telling her about funding. Um, really what that means is you've now moved her from done back into a working in progress uh piece, right? And not only that, it's crowding out other stuff that is already in your system. So that, that backwards flow is not good, although it's inevitable, right? So what we want is when your work flows backwards, you want to compare it again to the definition of done. And as you look at this, it's like, okay, something was missing. Like, what didn't I have in my definition of done that caused Erica to have to call me up a month later and me to have to do a bunch of free work in order to finish her, her stuff. And it turns out, oh, I don't have a good funding instructions document, right? So what you would want to make sure you do is it's okay for work to move backwards once, right? But what you don't want is for the same kind of work to move backwards multiple times for the same reason. So you update this definition of done checklist, you get it in the right place. And now every matter that comes through your system going forward is not going to have that same problem, right? And so now what you've actually done is created this, this thing where, okay, Ramirez and Hayes and all the rest are, are going to move more smoothly. What you've also done is implemented a feedback loop. Uh, to improve your workflow, right? And so you've taken a bit of information, something that was wrong with your process. Uh, you didn't just fix it and then move about your day. You fix the work, but then you go back and fix the process as well. And that's the key to this uh, continuous improvement, this notion of Kaizen out of lean um, and really making sure that you are continuously improving uh, your process. And that will, over time, significantly increase your ability to do more work. So uh, I am out of time. I will just do a quick uh, pitch, I guess, for, for my website. Uh, I'm in the process of transferring from one website to another. So uh, I am at agileattorney.com, but the place where I'm going is agile.legal. Um, if you get if you head there, uh, whoops, I got to click back in here. Um, 
I'm working on some courses, some some uh, other materials um, that you'll be able to to get access to um, if you join in at the various membership levels, um, and you know elements of this course will be up there. Uh, a lot of it in more detail because I won't be under uh, quite so much of a time constraint. I probably won't be talking quite as fast either. Uh, I also do a lot of um, executive coaching with law firm leaders uh, and team leads. Um, I love doing facilitated workshops and I have finally found some online tools um, that are working really well for me. One of the uh, uh, side effects, I guess maybe silver lining of the pandemic is that it's forced me to figure out how to deliver some things online that I had been doing in person. Uh, and then I do group training like this as well. So that's all I've got. Harry, I will let you wrap it up and uh, hopefully I am more or less in time. Thanks everyone. <laughs>